Hello, welcome to HBO's Crypto Corner for Wednesday, February 1st, 2023. We're already into February. We have quite a few things to talk about, so let's get started. Men in Utah take potential Bigfoot footage to local news. It must be any season. You can't just see something that's maybe once a once in a century discovery and go to your 9 to 5 job. You gotta go look for fur or footprints or some kind of evidence. That's what a local resident of Provo, Utah told the local news station when he and some friends saw and recorded a creature they believe is Sasquatch. The friends were unable to locate conclusive evidence, although they did find strange tracks mixed in among the footprints of deer. The men are happy to admit the unidentified creature in their video could be a bear, human, or other much less exciting answer, but they believe that what they saw was far too large for the usual Bigfoot sighting explanations. A curator for the local Natural History Museum of Utah was happy to go on record as saying that not only was that not a Bigfoot, but that such a creature definitively doesn't exist. He claims he has spent much of his career in remote locations in search of new species, but so far he has not found Bigfoot or anything like it. He says there are lots of undiscovered things in the natural world, but they don't take the shape of giant apes running around in largely settled areas of the world. And skepticism speaks again. Science speaks again. Quote, quote, unquote, science. Of course, folks over the ripe old age of 19 remember when the scientists gave much the same reasoning for why the giant squid couldn't possibly exist and was as ridiculous and as dismissible as Bigfoot. Less than 20 years and two species of giant squid later, it seems reasonable to allow some room for continued discoveries. Okay, I'm trying to get the video to play. I'm going to try and get this video to play, I hope. Big it is. I don't think it is a human. I think it's a Sasquatch. It was... The Bluebird January morning here in the foothills of Northeast Provo when a group of guys saw a figure on the mountain that looked like something they've never seen before. You can't just see something that's maybe a one. Once in a century discovery and go to your nine to five. job. You got to go look for fur or footprints or some kind of evidence. And the camera. Was rolling as Austin took to the mountain with a buddy on a search for the elusive. Bigfoot. So I'm seeing something that is not deer tracks anymore. We're trying to determine what it what, what it is. Their findings were inconclusive. Was it a bear? Maybe. That's plausible. Was it a person? Also plausible. Was it something else? I think that's also plausible. Who knows?
On the other hand, I spoke to a curator from the Natural History Museum of Utah who says not only is that figure in the video not Sasquatch, but it's safe to say that Sasquatch is not something that would even exist. What's the like? Hood, that there are big animals that have gone undetected by scientists and by trained observers. Dr. Eric Rickhart has. spent much of his career exploring places people have never gone before in search of new species. So far, no Bigfoot or anything like it. There are lots of undiscovered things, particularly in the natural world. But they don't take the form of giant apes running around in largely settled areas of the world. So what do you believe? I'm really hoping I get to go look again. Maybe there's something out there to find right here in Utah, even in Provo. So there you go. Very interesting. Very cool, too. Of course, you have the so-called expert, the enlightened scientist. saying, well, Sasquatch couldn't possibly exist. Yeah, and dude, you wouldn't know a Sasquatch if it slapped you in the face. Yeah, so-called enlightened science. So much for that. Here's a pretty recent article from January 6th. What's the best evidence Bigfoot exists? We don't believe in Bigfoot at Meteor, but we're damn interested in him. To see if a crew of staunch skeptics could be swayed, we gathered the most respected Bigfoot authorities to answer our most pressing questions. This is part one of our eight-part series, Ask a Squatcher. I don't believe that the moon affects the white-tail rut. There's simply too much science that tells us otherwise. But deep down, I'm always excited when the newest moon guide is released, and I'm eager to talk to hunters that are loyal to astronomy. I have the same feelings about Bigfoot. You can guarantee when I'm flipping through the channels there's a show about Sasquatch, I'm dropping the remote. Sometimes I think I'm more interested in Bigfoot and moon phases than people who actually believe they're real. In the first edition of Ask a Squatcher, I challenge our experts to do their best to persuade me he exists. Here are their answers. Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Idaho State University, is a professor of anatomy and anthropology. His lab in Pocatello, Idaho, houses over 300 footprint casts from a mysterious North American primate. He is the author of Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, which explores the scientific evidence for Bigfoot. Historical evidence for the existence of Bigfoot takes the form of North Native American accounts of a wild man of the woods. Depictions are remarkably similar across tribes considering the differing regional circumstances and interpretations. As European settlers pressed westward into the wilderness, they too reported encounters with wild men, boogers, giant hairy apes, mountain devils, etc. Frontiersmen's accounts are usually spun as sensational newspaper stories that were given little credence. From my perspective, as a student of human bipedalism, our adaptations for walking on two feet, the best contemporary evidence are the footprints that corroborate these stories of wild men. Something is leaving oversized human-like footprints. They are either hoaxed, misidentified, or the trace of a real species. The distinctive anatomy Documented consistently over the past 70 years is compelling evidence of the latter. Jeremiah Byron, Bigfoot Society Podcast. His weekly show provides a platform for the people who make it their life's work to prove that Bigfoot exists. 
My favorite evidence is the Bigfoot nests that have been found by Shane Corson and the members of the Exhibit Project in Washington State. Primatologists from unnamed zoos have been brought into the nest areas and have said that these nests are made by primates of some kind, due to their familiarity with how primates make structures. This tells me that we are dealing with a large North American ape primate, which simply has not been documented or captured due to the largely undiscovered and unexplored Pacific Northwest. Here's a photo of one of the nests. Bigfoot nest photo from Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum. Ronnie the Block, Expedition Bigfoot, a host of Expedition Bigfoot on the Travel Channel. His team claims to have Bigfoot evidence that includes hair samples, infrasound vocalizations, footprints, nests, and thermal imagery. He is the author of Monsterland, a deep dive on the Bigfoot phenomena. Some of the best evidence for Bigfoot continues to emerge from hikers, hunters, and those that are close to nature. Witnesses claiming to be repeatedly visited by Sasquatch families are becoming more commonplace. Reports of encountering bipedal, hairy, human-like creatures continues without any sign of slowing. When it comes to evidence, the patterson gibbon film of 1967 still holds the crown as the undisputed champion of a cryptid reality. The Sierra sounds recorded by Ron Moorhead and Al Barry is an honorable mention. Vocalizations below the range of normal human hearing by an unknown animal in North America, as well as incredible thermal imagery, has been captured by the team of Expedition Bigfoot while on location last year in Oregon. In regards to historical evidence, numerous Native American tribes throughout North America recognize Sasquatch as a real being. And it is not just here, it is an international phenomenon. Tribes across the U.S. have descriptions and names for these Bigfoot creatures. Some of these are menacing, like hairy cannibals, stone giants, or wood devil. Other names are more approachable, like the forest people, which describes Bigfoot as a creature that was respected and lived alongside. Knowledge keepers of the Hoopa tribe of Northern California, for example, list the seven sacred laws which act as the foundation of the relationship their people have with nature. Each of these laws is visually represented by a real animal. Included in the seven are a buffalo, an eagle, a bear, a beaver, a wolf, a turtle, and a Bigfoot. Matt Moneymaker, Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. His group has the most comprehensive sightings database in the world, with nearly 5,000 encounters recorded in the last 25 years. He is also a host of Finding Bigfoot on Animal Planet. The best evidence that Bigfoot exists is a personal matter. If you've seen a Bigfoot up close like I have, that is the, that is the best evidence by far. If you haven't seen a Bigfoot yourself, but you attended the Skookum, cast, Skookum Expedition in 2000, then the Skookum Cast is the best evidence for you. Prior to my close encounter, the best evidence was the howls and knocks I heard in Ohio. Prior to that, the tracks I saw in person and the eyewitnesses I met were the best evidence. If you are standing far away from the subject, then the best evidence is still a collective thing. It's the totality of the evidence, not just one item. If you can only view a single item and you need to pretend that it's the only item, then you should probably watch National Geographic's analysis of the patterson gimlin footage. So some pretty interesting perspectives there. Is Bigfoot dangerous? An oft-debated subject among Western hunters is the use of a pistol or bear spray in grizzly country. Oddly enough, you never hear Bigfoot experts talk about how to defend yourself from the only predator in the woods potentially bigger than a brown bear. Is it because Sasquatch's supposed force field deflects bullets and pepper spray? or because he's a misunderstood gentle giant that poses no threat to humans. Cliff Barrickman runs the North American Bigfoot Center, a museum dedicated to Sasquatch in Oregon. He is also the evidence analyst for Animal Planets Finding Bigfoot and made an appearance on History Channel's Monster Quest. Like any large anim wild animal, Sasquatch are potentially dangerous. However, their demeanor seems to be more like other ape species in that they are shy and reclusive by nature. 
The overwhelming majority of sighting reports include observations of Sasquatch simply walking away from the wilderness. Occasionally, the Sasquatch puts on a small display or acts aggressive, aggressively for a few moments, but if the person doesn't leave the area, the Sasquatch nearly always does. The very few reports of people being harmed by Sasquatch always have an instance of the human taking a shot at the creature or some other act of aggression on our part. Of course, we only hear from the witnesses that survive. Dr. Jeff Meldrum Naturally, any large predatory animal is potentially dangerous, deserving of proper deference. However, most reported encounters with Sasquatch are rather innocuous. When it sees Bigfoot in both retreat in opposite directions, Sasquatch is generally perceived as a shy, solitary creature that avoids human contact. With an ape's intelligence or better comes a level of curiosity, which I believe draws them to investigate human activities. In those few anecdotes where violence occurs, it is typically the human that is the antagonist shooting at the Sasquatch. Having said that, there are those who describe Bigfoot as a cannibal giant that eats hunters and abducts women and children, just as many African natives attributed such behaviors to the once mysterious gorillas. Throughout the Pacific and Inner Mountain West, Zunaqua and Sahabits are two of various names applied to the hairy monster that snatched Nate wayward children. Ronnie LeBlanc Sasquatch are more interested in evading us than pursuing us. Reports of rocks being launched from the darkness of the forest have been consistent over the years. Loud tree breaks have also been experienced when individuals have unexpectedly found themselves in a Sasquatch hotspot. Evidence of twisting hardwood trees has also been discovered in some of these Bigfoot areas. What classified species of animal can do this? None that we are aware of. Whatever it is, there's something extremely powerful that could rip us from limb, to, limb from limb if it wanted to. Aside from scaring off unwanted campers and investigators, rarely are people hurt. It seems they just simply want us out of their territory. One of the earliest and most recognized actions of aggression towards humans comes from the Oregon Oregonians in 1924. According to the article, five miners had their cabin attacked by several Sasquatch. The next day, one of the miners, Fred Beck, claimed to shoot one of these ape men and watch it drop into the gorge. There are also several Bigfoot researchers convinced that some people who go missing in forests are victims of Bigfoot taking them away. This echoes the early stories of hairy cannibals or hairy savages from Cherokee, Shawnee, and Chickasaw, Chickasaw tribes. Matt Moneymaker Bigfoot can and will kill dogs that attack them. With respect to humans, Bigfoot are the least dangerous of all large mammals, based on their track record of killing and hurting zero humans in modern times. Stories of humans disappearing in the same forest where Bigfoot reside just don't cut it. That is pure coincidence based on conjecture. You can just as easily blame UFOs for those disappearances. The absence of victims and injuries is the best evidence that Bigfoot simply do not attack humans. I've been close to them many times. Bigfoot have had many opportunities to harm me. Often I was alone and was trying to provoke them. They will sometimes try to scare humans and they do a good job of that, but that's all they do. Intimidation by throwing rocks works well and never seems to cause injuries. Avoiding physical contact seems to be a conscious decision on their part. During my intimidation encounters, I always got the sense that they wanted me to leave the area. They could be dangerous, but choose not to. And yet another interesting article there. Why have Bigfoot sightings decreased? According to a Bloomberg City Lab report, Bigfoot sightings have decreased over the last decade. Encounters with Sasquatch surged from 2000 to 2009, but have taken a dip since. If this were true of whitetails in Texas or walleye in Minnesota, biologists would plainly tell you their populations are down. When it comes to Bigfoot, nothing is so simple, though. We asked our group of experts for their take on this decline. Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Credible reports like documented footprints and visual encounters, remain relatively rare, relatively rare. The internet and social media have promoted the sharing of experiences while also planting expectations and interpretations to suggestible minds. There seems to be a proliferation of bumps in the night 
indeterminate spore, another ambiguous sign that are too heavily attributed to the Sasquatch. On the other hand, as the stigma associated with Bigfoot is dispelled, I find more credible, professional, and experienced witnesses are willing to discuss their encounters. These include park rangers, wildlife biologists, veterinarians, photographers, and hunters. Numbers can be misleading, as it is impossible to collect systematic data on such a serendipitous experience. And in spite of population growth and development, fewer people are venturing into the backcountry now compared to a half century ago. Ronnie LeBlanc There has been a downward trend in science since 2009, but I think we are going to see it swing in another direction. Bigfoot sightings, in my opinion, will see a surge this year due to COVID. I see more people hiking, running, or just being out in nature than ever before. More and more individuals are getting interested in hunting and fishing, too. With incredible video technology at our fingertips, we will have the ability to capture more evidence. I firmly believe there are going to be more sightings or findings of evidence in forests across the country this year. There are an enormous amount of unreported encounters due to ridicule, ridicule and fear. Some researchers believe that this unreported number of encounters could be as much as 5 to 10 times the reported number. Jeremiah Byron The Bigfoot population is not dying out, but there are less sightings because we as a culture are not going out in the woods anymore. It's as simple as that. Bigfoot is not going to show up in your Instagram DMs. You only see him while out exploring local state forests or national parks. When's the last time we took the time to do that? It's probably been a while since Bigfoot has seen a human either. Matt Moneymaker Sightings have not decreased in recent years. They just don't get reported in mainstream news as much anymore. Nowadays, sightings are reported almost exclusively on the Internet. I have the data to prove it as the founder of the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. The BFRO receives 95% of reports online and receives as many reports as it did in the 1990s. A belief that sightings don't occur as often anymore is purely a product of what you're hearing or not hearing in the mainstream media. The same can be said for UFOs. UFOs are seen just as often as before, but they don't get reported in the media unless there's video to show. So, is there a decrease in Sasquatch sightings? Depends on who you talk to, I think. What does Bigfoot eat? I've always heard it said that the diet of Bigfoot is like that of a bear. Our experts agree there, but when I read their responses about what Sasquatch eats, I actually see a lot of similarities to humans. A surprising omission from this list? Mushrooms. But I sincerely hope Bigfoot never discovers the elegant taste of a moral. They, they're hard enough to find already. Morals, not Sasquatch. Jeremiah Byron. Bigfoot are omnivores, which means they eat both plants and meat. I've seen accounts that they eat everything from berries, leaves, nuts, and fruit to salmon, rabbit, elk, and deer. Some people try attracting Bigfoot with fruit pies and leave them in a gifting area, which are usually taken by the Bigfoot the next day. An interesting fact I found about Bigfoot is that if you have an area with a large population boom of animals, such as salmon or rabbits, and this can be a thing that attracts the Bigfoot to that area. Ronnie LeBlanc It has been surmised that the diet of Sasquatch is consistent with that of bears. It is believed that they are omnivorous, and opportunistic eaters like coyotes when weather isn't favorable. Berries and fruits are plentiful in the Bigfoot hotspot regions. Deer is another plentiful and important food source that is believed to be their main protein source. Many sightings by hunters and hikers claim they saw Sasquatch chasing deer, as well as witnessing them dragging or carrying a deer carcass on their shoulders. Digging up rocks and stacking them to find rodents has also been witnessed. Grasses, roots, larvae, carrion, elk, ducks, fish, and vegetables plucked from farms and gardens are also food sources of Sasquatch. Stories from early settlers in New England tell of Bigfoot stealing hogs and cattle from farmers. Habituators, or people living close to Bigfoot families, 
say they'll eat everything from fish and venison to peanut butter sandwiches and Snickers. Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum Other than the occasional naughty child, the Sasquatch diet appears to be rather omnivorous. That is, they have a quite varied diet, including everything from roots and berries to salmon and elk. They don't have the claws or projecting canines of a carnivore. Instead, they have manual dexterity and massive jaws with enormous, thickly enameled grinding teeth, allowing them to process foods unavailable to competitors like bears. Their size and presumed primate gut physiology could make it possible to digest and detoxify a wider range of plant materials, from lichens to alder leaves. Natives complained of them stealing salmon from drying racks. Hunters witnessed them snatching deer from their sights. Cliff Barrickman Sasquatch are omnivores, so their diet includes both meat and plants. They have been observed eating various plants, both nutritional and medicinal. They have also been observed stalking and killing big game like deer and hogs, and small game like raccoons and rodents. So some really great observations of the Sasquatch diet. Now here's something interesting, the Loch Ness Monster, the weird saga of a dangerous exorcism at the Loch. On the night of June 2nd, 1973, Loch Ness played host to something truly extraordinary, something you may not know about. It was nothing less than a full-blown exorcism, one that was designed to forever banish the malignant monsters from the deep and dark waters. It was all the work of Donald Oman, both a doctor and a reverend. He was a man who had substantial knowledge on and experience of the domain of all things supernatural. Or of his thoughts on the Nessie phenomenon, Reverend Armand said, Each year I drive along most of the long, somewhat tedious shore of Loch Ness and traveling from the Kyle of Loch Coish to Inverness, and never yet have I observed the monster. We should not, however, interpret this to mean that Ormond was a skeptic when it came to Loch Ness creatures. In fact, quite the opposite is the case. He believed that one had to be at the Loch at the right time to encounter one of the monsters. His reasoning was simple. The Nessies are supernatural entities that can only be encountered when the circumstances are conducive to an encounter. For Ormond, the monsters were projections of something large and terrifying from a bygone era. Monsters that may have existed millions of years ago, but which continued to manifest, albeit in paranormal form. For the God-fearing reverend, the supernatural beasts had to be cast out, and the sooner the better, too. He was helped in his venture by none other than Ted Holliday. Holliday's interest in Armand's opinions on the monsters of Loch Ness were prompted by the latter's book, Experiences of a Present-Day Priest. It's a book that details the Reverend's nagging and worrying suspicions that lake monsters have supernatural rather than physical origins. Ormond was someone who would also focus his attention on combating black magic and witchcraft, and even exorcised bears, lions, and tigers believed to have been in the throes of dark demonic possession. He was then... Hardly your average priest, but he was exactly the kind of priest needed to rid Loch Ness of its strange inhabitants. It's worth noting now and how and why the Reverend Donald Ormond became so deeply immersed in the Loch Ness monster controversy. In 1967, he had his own sighting of a black hump beast in Loch Long, which is located in Argyll and Butte, Scotland. It was only in view for a few, for mere moments, but even so, it was still long enough for Armand to have gotten a clear look at it and to realize it wasn't anything so simple as a wave or running tree trunk. It was a monster, and it was a monster that seemingly had the ability to boil and bubble the water. Armand was further exposed to the mysteries of water monsters in the following year, 1968. The very same year in which Nessie Seeker Ted Holliday was coming around to the idea that the Nessies had supernatural origins. Oman had confided in a friend in what he had seen in the Loch Long in nineteen sixty seven. That friend was a Norwegian sailor named John Jan Anderson.
the upshot, or maybe Yod, I'm not sure, Yod Anderson. The upshot of this revelation was that Captain Anderson invited Oman to accompany him in June 1968 on a trip through the Fjord of the Trolls, otherwise known as the Eerious Waterway in Norway. Oman jumped at the opportunity. Had he known what was going to happen, Oman might have declined the invite. As the pair negotiated the mysterious waters, and just like at Loch Long, one year earlier, the water began to boil and bubble. As if right on cue, a pair of large, dark-colored humps rose from the depths and headed directly for Anderson's boat. Such was the size of the humps Oman was deeply afraid that the Leviathan might actually capsize the vessel and send the pair to Davy Jones's locker. It was not to be, however. Captain Anderson reassured Oman that the animal would bring no harm to them. Sure enough, at the last moment, the creature abruptly changed course and sank beneath the surface. Anderson stressed to Oman the importance of recognizing that although the monster did no physical harm, it was definitively mal malevolent. Puzzled as to how the monster could be considered evil when the pair was not hurt, Oman was told by Anderson that such creatures did not bring physical harm to anyone as they wished to be perceived as being non-malevolent. This, however, was nothing more than a cunning and callous ruse. Oman asked Anderson what he meant by that, and the seafarer replied that it was not the bodies of the witnesses that the creatures were sent on disrupting, but their minds and characters and to the point of provoking anxiety, paranoia, and finally mental collapse. Ted Holliday could personally relate to Anderson's words and how his personal mindset had been radically altered and manipulated by exposure to the Nessies. Holliday wasted no time in sending Oman a letter, applauding him on his train of thought. It was a letter and the praise which led Oman to invite Holliday to spend a weekend with him at his home in Devon, England. Holiday didn't need to be asked twice. He jumped at the opportunity. During the course of their monster-themed meeting, Holiday learned that Oman had already spoken with the Bishop of Crediton about performing an exorcism at Loch Ness, which the Bishop thought was an excellent idea. Given his dramatic change of opinion on the nature of the lake monsters of Loch Ness, Holiday thought it would be a very wise move, too. Holiday had another reason for contacting Oman. 1973 marked the publication of Holiday's second book on lake monsters, The Dragon and the Disc. Holiday gave his book just about the most relevant and applicable subtitle as possible, An Investigation into the Totally Fantastic. It was in the pages of The Dragon and the Disc that Holiday said finally said goodbye to his earlier and far more down-to-earth theories for the things of Loch Ness. His new book encompassed not just the paranormal side of the lake monsters in general, and the Nessies in particular, but UFOs in both times, ancient and modern, too. He also dwelled on that curiously synchronistic series of events that spanned 1969-1971, and which were focused around Alistair Crowley, Bullskine House, an unsettling dragon cult, and Dr. John Dee and his modern-day, slightly sinister relative. And so, keeping all this in mind, Holiday set a date to meet with Reverend Oman, the one man who, more than any other, shared Holiday's deep conviction that the monsters were not what they seemed to be. They were worse, much, much worse, and now it was time to confront them, maybe even head-on. The decision was reached to undertake a number of exorcisms, several on the shore at various points during, along the lock and one in the dead center, on the water itself. A small boat was generously provided by Wing Commander Basil Carey, who lived with his wife near the shore of the lock, and was particularly intrigued by the, by the monster legend. The BBC was intrigued too and was determined to be on the scene to capture the exorcism on camera or as it transpired, a recreation, since the camera crew turned up late. As things began, the seriousness of the affair quickly became apparent. When the pair, along with Tony Artis, a captain of the British Army with an interest in the controversy of Nessie, and a photographer friend of Oman, 
Arad didn't lock in. Amon asked the pair to kneel, which they did, and the holy water is sprinkled on their foreheads in the shape of a cross. As if right on cue, a chilled wind suddenly enveloped the area. That was not necessarily a good sign at all. With that act performed, Oman approached the mysterious waters, lowered his head, and said in quiet, deliberate tones, I exercise thee, O creature of salt, by the living God, by the true God, by the holy God, by that God who by the prophet Eliseus commanded thee to be cast into the water to cure its barrenness, that thou mayest by this exorcism be made beneficial to the faithful, and become to all those who make use of of thee beautiful both to soul and body, and that in whatsoever place thou shalt be sprinkled, all illusions of wickedness and wickedness and crafty wiles of Satan may be chased away and depart from that place, and every unclean spirit commanded in his name, who is to come to judge the living and the dead of the world by fire. It was quite a statement to be sure. Oman continued, asking for Lot Ness and its surroundings to be free of malevolent supernatural spirits, and that the monsters be forever dispatched to a paranormal realm far away from the lock. Just for good measure, Oman sprinkled a liberal amount of holy water into the lock. The same ritual was undertaken, and the same words were spoken, and a pebbled stretch of beach on Bor at Borland Bay and at Fort Augustus, these particular exorcisms had a profound effect on Ted Holliday. Looking back on that night a few years later, he said that while he held no particular firm beliefs when it came to the matter of religion, I felt a distinct tension creep into the atmosphere at this point. It was as if we had shifted some invisible levers and were awaiting the result. In addition, Holliday recalled that the photographer looked very worried. Tony Artis had plunged into a state of complete silence. Only the Reverend seemed unaffected by the near unique situation all four found themselves in. At the time the final land based exorcism was over, evening was nearing its end, and the all enveloping darkness of night was beginning to blanket the area. There was no time to waste. The intrepid mariners headed for the waters of Fort Augustus intent on bringing the matter of Nessie's presence to a hopeful closure. White caps and a howling wind appeared, seemingly out of nowhere. Yet again it appeared. A bad sign was the order of the day, or rather of the night. Holiday felt a distinct air of menace envelop him, and he took a deep breath. If there be monsters, now was possibly the time for them to make their presence known and engage the Reverend in the ultimate battle of good versus evil. Once again, the Reverend had words to say, and to say out loud, as he called for the reign of the monsters to end and for their banishing from Loch Ness. The last of the holy water was then poured into the lock, amid hopes that it would help to drive the paranormal presence away for good. Instead, something else happened. The Reverend Oman visibly and suddenly paled, shivered, and appeared close to passing out. The group raced to get the boat to the shore, and that, and there then followed the torturously slow walk across the surrounding, now darkness-filled hills. It was a walk that saw Holiday and Tony Artis constantly supporting Om Oman to prevent him from keeling over onto the grass. Despite the seemingly serious nature of the situation, Oman later explained that feeling drained and lightheaded were two of the classic after-effects of performing exorcism and nothing to overly worry about. After a while, Oman was fully recovered and the group retired to their beds, earnestly hoping and praying that the Nessies would never again darken Loch Ness. As history has shown, however, they did, time and time again. Perhaps as some form of malignant backlash against the valiant attempts to banish the monsters, dark forces seemed to hover ominously around the area for almost a week afterwards. Several days after the exorcism, Holiday took a nighttime drive to the home of Basil and Winfred Carey, specifically to get their views on the Sunberg UFO encounter at Loch Ness in August 1971. <coughs> a psychic with notable powers of precognition, and someone who had spent time in India and who worked for the Special Operations Executive during the Second World War, 
Mrs. Carey was not someone who encouraged delving into the domain of the unknown. She did her utmost to discourage it. As Holiday brought up the matter of the UFO encounter, Mrs. Carey's face took on a deeply furrowed frown, then a look of concern, and finally one of out downright fear. In no uncertain terms, she quietly cautioned Holiday to keep away from the reported landing site of the allegedly alien craft, warning him that the only outcome of such an action could be, would be disaster, or worse. An evil presence was apparently hovering around and listening intently to her words. At that very moment, a whirlwind-like sound filled the air, shadowy and racing forms filled the garden, and heavy thumping sounds reverberated around the old property. A plume of a black, smoke-like substance appeared amid the garden's flowers and plants. An ear-splitting scream from Mrs. Carey filled the living room. The entire household was briefly enveloped by a cloak of terror and mayhem. After around twenty seconds or so, however, normality was returned and the brief atmosphere of paranormal terror was gone. I gotta tell you, that's a pretty freaky story. Very interesting, but also freaky. Before I move on to the next story, I imagine you want to hear my thoughts about the possibility that Loch Ness Monster is more paranormal than anything else. It's entirely possible. I don't discount it. It could be possible. That could be why we don't have evidence of it. Sasquatch could be paranormal. We really don't know. That's the thing. We don't know. Although I personally believe the Sasquatch are flesh and blood, they may not be. You never know. Anyhow, going on, a suspected Bigfoot spotted crossing snowy field in Utah. At first glance, it appears to be nothing more than a snow-covered hill, peppered with dark flecks of winter bear trees. The most observant will notice one of those tiny flecks moving, and the camera zooms in to reveal the black silhouette of a bipedal form trudging through the snow. Two legs plodding with wide steps through the snow are distinctly visible despite the extreme distance, but there is a strange lack of swinging arm movement to accompany the swift pace across the barren hill. This is the video, by the way. I believe this is the object in question, right here. Where you see me pointing. The moving object. That didn't take very long. Skeptics will immediately point out this could also be a totally average human who happened to be keeping their hands in their pockets for warmth. And that is a fair point. 
It also seems strange that a person would be out crossing such an isolated area in cold, snowy weather conditions with no sign of a backpack or other gear to suggest what they are doing. They also don't seem to be making any attempt to hide or keep to cover. Unlike most suspected Bigfoot sightings, none increased it potentially being a human pedestrian in an unlikely area. Interestingly, even when people do step forward to say they were misidentified as cryptid, they can still be met with disbelief as a professional mermaid recently discovered when she accidentally surprised some divers during an underwater photo shoot. While this particular footage is less than compelling, there has been a large increase in Sasquatch sightings and videos claiming to show these mysterious cryptids in the wild, and many leave room for doubt as to what it is we are really seeing. Even Jane Goodall, one of the world's leading primatologists, believes it's quite possible that there is an undiscovered intelligent primate species out there, specifically hiding from their human cousins. So, what is in this video? Is it just a person? Or is it indeed a Sasquatch? Uh, we really don't know. It seems to be too far away. But who knows? Maybe it was Sasquatch. There's always that possibility. You never want to discount that possibility. Finally, here's, a, here's something interesting. Giant inflatable Bigfoot stolen from Sasquatch Festival in Washington. What may be the most brazen case of Bigfoot banditry to date occurred this past weekend with a stinky-fingered Near do well in Washington State made off with a massive inflatable Sasquatch from a festival devoted to the famed cryptid. The weird heist reportedly unfolded on Saturday evening at the conclusion of the 7th annual Squatch Fest in the city of Lakeview. The wildly popular event, which was expected to draw around 3,000 people, featured an array of presentations from researchers as well as a bevy of food trucks and vendors selling all manner of Sasquatch-related goods. The proverbial centerpiece of the celebration was an enormous inflatable Bigfoot, which greeted visitors as they arrived at the event venue, until it vanished. Logging to social media early Sunday morning, the Squatch Fest organizers announced that someone had stolen the Bigfoot at some point, at the end of the event as the vendors and speakers were packing up to go home. Given the considerable size of the piece, which was the star of countless photos from the weekend, one might think that stealing it would be something of a challenge. However, the Bigfoot bandit behind the heist cleverly snatched the Sasquatch after it had been deflated and presumably stuffed into a box. While one hopes that the piece was simply taken by accident and will be returned, as of now, the inflatable cryptid remains at large as police investigate the disappearance. <coughs> this is why you don't take stuff that doesn't belong to you. I suppose somebody thought they were going to have a cool souvenir from the event. But... <laughs> This is not the way to go about getting souvenirs. There's plenty of vendors. You can buy something. Don't tell me people are going to be that freaking cheap. And that's going to do it for this week. This special, extra special, long edition of HBM's Crypto Corner. Well, thank you very much for tuning in. You guys are the heart of the show. I always say that, but I always mean it. Now, continue to do this as you guys want me to. And hey, until next week, y'all be good or be good at this HM's Crypto Corner.